In nearly every other major sport, when you are asked to describe the playing field, every single portion of it is standard. That is true in the NFL, NBA, MLS, and the NHL. But when it comes to baseball, no two parks are the same. And that is a huge deal for a sport obsessed with quantitative evaluations. It's so important, in fact, that some parks can be clearly labeled as a hitter's park, while others labeled as a pitcher's park. In today's video, we are going to be breaking down everything you need to know about park factors, and at the end, list out the top 5 hitters and pitchers parks in the league today. But before we jump into it guys, if you enjoy the content you're seeing on this channel and you want to continue to see more of it, it'd mean a lot if you'd click that subscribe button. I'm a numbers guy, and only about 30% of the people who watch these videos are actually subscribed, so show your support by clicking the subscribe button down below. Before we can get into a leaderboard, let's first understand what park factors are. In the simplest terms, it's a metric used to describe the effects the playing field has on every single plate appearance. To oversimplify this idea, imagine if you went to a big league park and dead center was 500 feet away from home plate. That's huge! To put that in perspective, the furthest home run ever hit in the home run derby was Juan Soto's 520 foot blast this year at Coors Field. So it's safe to say, a park with these dimensions would favor a pitcher. But imagine if the center field wall was only 200 feet away, making this smaller than your typical softball field. Balls would fly out of this park nearly every inning, thus benefiting any hitter stepping up to the plate. However, it's easy to think that big parks equate to a pitcher's park, and a small park benefits hitters more, when that really isn't the case. If all ballparks shared the same nice outfield fence curve like you see here, then yes, that would be most of what matters, but baseball fields come in all shapes and sizes, so there's more to it than just that. So much more goes into making a park a hitter's or a pitcher's park, and while the dimensions play a role in that, many other things do too, like average weather, elevation, and even the way the stands are set up, or the surrounding structures outside of the stadium. So great, that's what park factors are, but why should anybody care to use them? To understand this, let's go through a quick example. At every stadium, we have a huge amount of data at our fingertips, including every combination of batted ball data tied with the result of what's happened at each stadium in the past. If a ball was hit at a 90 mile per hour exit velocity and at an 18 degree launch angle, it may end up right around here. At our example stadium, we will say that according to past data, this typically results in a single here. And that's great! In 20 parks, we can expect a similar result of a ball hit with those metrics. But, at 7 parks, this exact same ball typically is recorded as an out. And in the remaining 3, the hitter is expected to double. And that is exactly what makes park factors so valuable, because the playing field itself has a direct impact on the results of the game. The difference between a single and an out is huge. An out and a double is even bigger. That could be the difference between winning and losing, all decided by how the ball leaves the bat differently in different stadiums due to the things like the list we made earlier. Now that we understand what park factors are and why they're so important, let's dive into how they're calculated. So into park factor calculations. You'll notice the S at the end of this title because many different places have many different ways to quantify a park's impact on the outcomes of games. In this video, I'm going to dive into the way Fangraphs describes it in an article posted all the way back in 2010. We've come a long way since then. But the concepts I'll be describing help paint a picture of why these calculations are so different. As always, links in the description if you want to read more. When it comes down to it, park factors are typically calculated in two ways. Runs and components. Starting with runs, if you are already familiar with this topic, you are probably used to seeing park factor displayed as the number of runs a park can contribute to teams that play there. This is definitely the more common calculation. The idea here is to find a single value that calculates the number of more or less runs scored in this ballpark by any teams that play there as compared to other parks. For example, you may see that Coors Field has a park factor run score of 1.275 this year. You may also see this displayed out of 100, so 127 would be representing the same number. 1 or 100 is considered an average park, so a score of 1.275 would read as 27 and a half more runs are scored at this park than the average park. Now, we aren't just measuring the performance of the Rockies at home. This stat takes into account any organized game played at Coors Field, whether that's the home team or the visiting team. This way of breaking down park factors is best suited for ranking stadiums based on their favorability for hitters or pitchers, since it summarizes it in only one number. 
Then we can jump over to the component side of park factors. This takes our park factors a step further by not only breaking down the number of runs scored at a stadium compared to average, but every single outcome that can occur during a plate appearance at each stadium in comparing them. For example, you can look at this list of park factors by play result. Anything above one would signify that this happens at an above average rate. So in this case, our singles would be 18% more likely to occur than at the average part, and strikeouts actually occur 15% less often than at other parks. This is incredibly important for breaking down individual players' performances, as it helps neutralize the effects of playing at different ballparks more accurately than just a run value. However, as you can imagine, this way is much more complex, as you now must weigh every single result as compared to the player's production at every single stadium to get a completely park-neutral outcome. And this isn't even getting to the fact that lefties may perform better at some stadiums and righties at others, or the required sample size to make such claims. So, that leaves us with one final thing to cover. Let's take a look at what StatCast ranks as the top 5 friendliest hitter parks and the top 5 best pitcher parks. On Baseball Savant, you'll find a page listing out all of the parks with all of the things we talked about in today's video. To correct for a smaller sample size, the leaderboard we're showing today includes a rolling average of each park's performance over the past three seasons. Starting with our hitters. The number 5 best hitters park is going to be Angel Stadium, home of the Angels, with a park factor of 104. This means that runs are typically scored at a 4% higher rate than the rest of the parks in the MOB. Coming in at number 4 is Truist Park, the new home of the Braves at 104 as well. Number 3 goes to Great American Ballpark, home of the Reds at 105. Number 2 shockingly goes to Fenway Park, home of the Green Monster at 106. And blowing away the rest of the competition, to nobody's surprise, is Coors Field, with a whopping 115 park factor. Next up are our top 5 worst hitters parks or friendliest pitcher parks, starting with City Field, home of the Mets with 96. In 4th comes the Rays home ballpark Tropicana Field at 95, followed by the A's Oakland Coliseum with 94, in the semi-recently renamed Oracle Park, home of the San Francisco Giants, and our pitcher friendliest park of the last 3 years would be T-Mobile Park, home of the Seattle Mariners. So there you have it, the top 5 best hitters and pitchers parks over the past few seasons. All of this information was found over on Baseball Savant, and I'd highly recommend you go there and check out this leaderboard yourself, as you can really find some cool things there. For example, the Reds home field plays as a top 3 hitters park, but it also owns the 5th highest strikeout rate among all of the parks. Then, the Mets home field over on our top 5 pitchers field finishes in the top 5 of not only one, but two hitters categories, in both triples and walks, with triples coming in at a whopping 149. Tons of fun stuff over there, so if you check it out and find anything else, be sure to follow up in the comments below. Now, let's wrap this thing up. What are my main takeaways on park values? Well, hopefully after watching this video, you've come to answer the question, why equalizing the effects of the field of play each park brings to the table is important. Because as you can see here, no two parks are even close to being remotely the same, whether that is just the footprint of its boundaries or the heights of the walls. In learning about park factors, you now understand what goes into those park neutral stats signified with a plus or a minus at the end of it, like ERA plus. However, park factors aren't perfect yet. Different things like lefties and righties have been kind of flushed out, but the effects of weather that day can significantly influence the results of ground balls and fly balls, or how fast athletes and slow athletes perform, but the idea is definitely valid. The point is that the one number approach almost never works in this sport, but it doesn't mean that it isn't important to understand the effects that certain parks have on different hitters and pitchers. Thanks to sites like Fangraphs and Baseball Savant, us curious folks have easy access to this information because they're doing all the heavy lifting behind the scenes. So thanks to those guys and thank you for watching. Thanks for tuning in to today's video guys. If you enjoyed, please hit that subscribe button. If you want to keep learning more, here's a video and a playlist that I think you'd enjoy checking out. I'll catch you in the next one.